All right, good morning. Uh, it is a joy to be here today. Uh, we'll be looking at Galatians uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 3. Uh, but before I read the text, you know, I wonder, I look at a, a crowd this size and I wonder uh, how many coffee lovers uh, may be here in the room. Um, you know, early in my coffee journeys, uh, me and my wife would have very spirited conversations um, about how much creamer uh, a person is allowed to put into a cup of coffee and still call it coffee. Um, there are some people, you know, I call them the purists, uh, they love their coffee black. Um, there we go. Uh, uh, some maybe who prefer it with a dash of cream. Uh, and then there are others uh, who really prefer a cup of cream uh, with a dash of coffee. Uh, and so there's completely no judgment here. Here at Emmanuel, we welcome and accept all kinds of coffee drinkers. Um, you know, when it comes to coffee, there is freedom to mix things up. Uh, you can add cream, you can add sugar, you can add all sorts of things, and the cup still qualifies as coffee. Uh, but you know, when it comes to the message of the gospel, adding anything to the finished work of Jesus does not enhance it, it diminishes it. To put it another way, any gospel revision always equals gospel reversal. Uh, and this is why we have this part of the Bible called Galatians. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he writes this letter to a group of believers uh, who needed a reminder that faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ crucified for them was all they needed to be fully acceptable to God. Uh, there was no need to add anything in addition, no need to add human effort, human accomplishments, or anything on top of that. Jesus paid it all. The gospel of free grace is the only way to joy and to life. Uh, and for a time, these dear Galatians, they were embracing uh, the gospel of freedom. God's free grace, uh, but it did not take long before they were drifting away uh, from the joy of relying on Jesus to the tyranny of self-reliance. And so Paul writes to draw their attention back again to the finished work of Christ on the cross for them. Uh, so if you're here today, if you're new here today, uh, we're so glad that you're here. Maybe you're wondering, you know, kind of what you stepped into. Uh, is this a sermon series in, in the book of Galatians? Or uh, is there some sort of special reason uh, why we're here at this place? And the answer is no and no. Um, you know, I chose Galatians uh, 3 because it is key for me in my own personal life to understanding how we never outgrow the gospel. We never outgrow the gospel. The gospel is foundational, and we must constantly go back to its promises in power uh, for our sense of identity, for our sense of righteousness. Uh, so let me read, I'll read Galatians 3, 1 through 3. You can follow along, we have screens. We also have pew Bibles, uh, feel free to grab one of those. Um, Galatians chapter three, verses one through three. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? This is the word of the Lord. Um, I have three points for us today, three verses, three points, and these points are basically just three reminders. Uh, the first reminder is that we should remember that the work is done. Secondly, remember that grace through faith explains our place. And thirdly, uh, remember that we go on the same way that we got in. So let's start at the beginning. Remember that the work is done. Uh, it was um, 16th uh, century reformer Martin Luther. Maybe some of us uh, have heard about him. Um, he said, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. Uh, and, you know, human nature has not changed uh, since then. We need a reminder like that today. Uh, and so did the Galatians. So take a look at the very beginning of verse uh, one. Uh, Paul says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? 
Now, it, it's obvious that Paul, he's, uh, he's very emotional here. Uh, he's not out of control, but he is in shock. He's taken aback because something is threatening the very people whom Jesus loves. So what's all the fuss about? Well, for the, the past few chapters in Galatians, you know, Paul has been defending his apostleship. He's been defending the gospel that he preached. And usually when we see a person that's adamantly defending their kind of position of authority, we're immediately thinking, okay, this person is on a power trip. Uh, but this is not the case with Paul. He's only defending his ministry, his apostleship, because certain men came into the church preaching another gospel and questioning the validity of Paul's ministry and also his message, especially. Uh, Paul was preaching the gospel of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Free grace. In other words, Paul was saying, you can be accepted by God on the basis of not what you do, but on his grace, you don't have to earn it. You don't merit it. This was Paul's message. Uh, but there were these opponents of Paul who were saying, you know, this Paul, eh, his message is off. You know, if you really wanted to be accepted by God, uh, and if you really wanted to belong, uh, you had to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. You know, there is a, there's an old saying that goes something like this. Maybe you've heard about it. Uh, it, it simply, you know, there ain't no such thing as free lunch. Uh, and this is what Paul's opponents, they were saying. They were saying, you know, Paul's not telling you the whole truth. There ain't no such thing as free lunch. Uh, and it's so easy for us to kind of fall into that sort of pattern of thinking. It's a, it's a very native way of thinking. Uh, we could think about the grace of God in that way, almost as if it's just too good to be true. So we hear about the lavishness of God. We hear about his mercy. We hear about his bounty. We sing songs about it. Uh, and it just sounds too good to be true. And we're asking almost inwardly, like, what's the catch? What's the catch? And maybe there's a little bit of suspicion. Um, growing up as a kid, uh, my family lived in uh, New York City. And so we would make frequent trips up to New York City. And uh, at the time, they would have these toll booths. And you'd stop at the toll booth. Uh, and there were just a, a number of folks that were like trying to like clean your glass, your window. And you could always tell who was kind of like a, around New York a bunch. Th those folks just did not give any attention at all. Uh, but the tourists did. And essentially, if you give eye contact, they look and they're like, we got you. We're, you know, we're wiping your window. Uh, and, you know, maybe they thought, you know, these folks are just being nice. They're just doing it for free. But it wasn't for free because once they got your window wiped, they're like, hey, here's uh, we need to get paid. Right. And, you know, sometimes we can kind of project that same idea, though. What's the catch idea onto God? Because free grace, it just sounds too good to be true. But friends, it is true. It is true. And Paul is taken aback because the Galatians were beginning to listen uh, to these opponents. This is why Paul says, Oh, foolish Galatians. He, he just kind of bursts out on the page with that. Now, he's not name calling. He's not browbeating. He's not doing anything like that. Uh, they were not foolish because, you know, they lacked some sort of intellectual capacity. Uh, this was a spiritual forgetfulness. That's what he's talking about. Almost as if someone had charmed them and erased their gospel memory, which is why Paul says, who has bewitched you? You know, if this were, you know, 2023, we could say, uh, you know, who's hoodwinked you? Who's bamboozled you? This is a false gospel. Now, I, I don't want to get ahead uh, of myself here, but basically every false gospel, every false promise, it, it tells you that you can find something about like your identity, your significance, and something that you can do, right? So if you do this, then you will be this. And the reason why this kind of appeals to us, why we can be charmed by something like this, is because we naturally kind of drift towards a kind of self-reliance. Uh, and, you know, Paul is saying, he understands this, but Paul is saying, the message that you heard from me was not a message of self-reliance. They did not hear the message of human power and human wisdom. What they heard was the message of Christ and him crucified, which is why Paul says in the second half of verse one, it was before your eyes 
that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. It was before your eyes? Really, Paul? How was it before your eyes? How so? They were not physically present at the crucifixion of Jesus, just as we were not physically present. So how could Paul say that it was before their eyes? Well, Paul is making a point about the preaching, the announcing of the gospel. When the gospel is truly preached, Christ is truly present by his spirit. So when Paul openly announced good news for bad people through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, it was as if the Galatians were there beholding this wonder. And it wasn't because Paul was uh, some amazing preacher. The the power was not in him, uh, but the power was in the, the gospel simply preached clearly preached. So Paul says the same thing in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that, uh, you know, when he came to them, he did not come proclaiming to them uh, the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross of Christ was at the center of Paul's preaching. It was at the center of his ministry. Uh, And that's because the cross is central to Christianity. Uh, There is no Christianity without the cross. Um, You know, there are some people, you know, even friends and neighbors of ours who who may, you know, they have a a high view of um, Jesus to an extent. Um, They teach that Jesus was like this great teacher. And so they're trying to give some sort of homage and respect. But with no cross, there's no Christianity. Uh, Some teach that Jesus was, maybe he was a great religious leader at best. But friends, there is no Christianity without the cross. Others may teach that at best he's this miracle worker. He does amazing things. But there is no Christianity without the cross. The cross tells the truth about who Jesus is. He's not merely a great teacher. He's not merely a great miracle worker or anything like that. He is the Son of God who came down to bear the judgment of God in the place of guilty sinners through his death. Many people died on a Roman cross. But the death of Jesus, this was a death. This death was unlike any other death. His death actually accomplished our redemption. So when Jesus gave up his life for us, he could announce something like this. It is finished. Finished. Take the thought in to your mind and take that thought into your heart. Jesus did not say, well, guys, um, this is my part. Now the rest is up to you. He didn't say, you know, how about we go 50-50 and meet halfway? No, Jesus says, it is is finished. Jesus paid it all. Uh, You know, this is why we love talking about the finished work of Jesus here at Emmanuel, uh, because the cross is a complete work. It is at the cross that we have forgiveness that pardons our sins, cleansing that removes our guilty stains. There, There is peace that reconciles us to God. And at the cross, there is righteousness that justifies the ungodly. And we'll come back to that in a few moments. But the bottom line here is that at the cross, the work is done. Uh, We cannot do a better job than Jesus did at the cross. Uh, There is a a song. uh, It's it's an old song. Anything you can do, I can do better. Okay, this is what the finished work of Christ is saying to us. We couldn't live a better life. Receive it. (laughs) We couldn't die a better death. The work is done. And Paul is saying to the Galatians, uh, there is no part of salvation that God has kind of left undone. uh, So you don't have to look anywhere else. Uh, And so the more that we consider the cross, the finished work of Jesus, the more we internalize the truth that all of this, the salvation, all of this, it's all of grace. Uh, Which brings us to this next reminder. Remember that grace through faith explains our place. So what does it take uh, to have a place in God's family? What, what must I do to belong? Now, uh, back in chapter 2, the apostle Paul, he confronts the apostle Peter uh, with what John Stott calls one of the most tense and dramatic episodes in the New Testament. 
Uh, Peter, he was having fellowship and eating with non-Jewish believers, uh, Gentiles. Uh, and eating together, this was a way of communicating uh, that we are accepted. We are belonging together. We are together. Uh, but there was uh, this legalistic group, uh, a group that uh, was disturbing the church. They, they taught that people do not belong in God's family unless they add like circumcision, uh, which is a, it's a false gospel. Uh, but when they came, you know, Peter, he ends up ditching his Gentile friends. And, uh, you know, Paul says it was out of fear. And by doing this, Peter was unwittingly reinforcing the idea that our standing before God, our place in his family, in his kingdom, is based on something that we do. And Paul's point here is that, no, it's not. Our acceptance is not based on something we're doing, but on what has been done. Uh, we have a place in God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Look at verse 2. Uh, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, this is a rhetorical question. Uh, the answer was obvious to the Galatians. They knew that when Paul came and preached the good news to them, all they did was receive it. They just believed it. Uh, they didn't have to add a bunch of works on top of that. They, um, you know, didn't have to go out and get circumcised. Uh, they didn't have to go and, and show their, you know, loyalty to Jesus before he would uh, save them. Uh, you know, he didn't tell them that they had to go out and do some sort of amazing thing uh, to show that they are really on board. There was nothing like that added on top of that. They simply believed the gospel of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And God himself poured out his spirit into their hearts through faith. Amazing. Now, here's the sidebar. Every believer, if you're here today and you're, you know, you're like, man, that's, that sounds amazing. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. There, so there's not, don't think there are like tears, you know, of, there's the first class Christians that have the Holy Spirit and then the, the second class Christians that don't, but they're working towards it. That's not the way it works, right? To be a Christian is to be spirit indwelt. Every believer is a new creation by the Spirit. Romans 5.5 5 says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Poured. <laughs> and Paul's question is, how did that happen, Galatians? Was it because you obeyed the law or was it because you believed the message of the gospel? And the Galatians knew the answer. They could say, yes, Paul, it, it wasn't obedience to the law, but faith in the gospel. Every spiritual blessing was poured out freely when they believed, not when they obeyed. But they were losing sight of this. And this is because we drift towards this self-reliance. So we often forget that our place before God is not based on what we do, but on what has been done for us. And this is Paul's point. Uh, his opponents were teaching that our place in God's family is based, at least in part, on something that we're bringing to the table. Uh, maybe some sort of barter. Uh, and they were pointing to the law of Moses uh, to make their point. Uh, but they were ultimately, they were twisting the law. Paul later on says that the law was a guardian. It was leading us to Christ, but it was never meant to save us. Uh, it can't give us life. Uh, but so often we lose sight of this. We forget that. And we have to remember that no amount of doing could explain our place before God. Only grace through faith can explain our place. And what exactly is our place before God. You know, the gospel uh, tells us that we have a righteous standing before God. That we are we're justified just as if we had never sinned and just as if we had always obeyed. Amazing. And that's because when God justifies the ungodly, he pronounces a sinner to be righteous, not because we are righteous in and of ourselves, but because of the righteousness of another, Jesus. He then credits that to our account. So think of it like, you know, you have a, 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 some sort of debt um, and you're just in the hole. You can't see a way out. And some really nice benevolent person comes and says, hey, 
I will write a check and I will zero it out. I mean, that's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. But suppose this very generous individual says, you know, in addition to that, uh, I'm going to credit this account with so much wealth, you know, like you'll never be able to outspend it. <laughs> okay, this is like justification. It goes beyond just even removing the debt. In justification, we're not just not guilty. Justification means that in God's eyes, he sees us just as if we had never sinned and as if we had always obeyed. That is our standing before God. And the good news of the gospel is that it comes not from us doing anything, but by the grace of God through faith. So let's talk about faith, faith in the gospel. Uh, if you drop your eyes down to uh, verse six, you know, Paul gives an example of justification by faith. Uh, from the Old Testament, he highlights Abraham that he believed and it was counted to him as uh, righteousness. That's another way of talking about justification. Uh, but here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that Abraham's faith was his righteousness. Now I bring this up uh, because it's entirely possible to take one of the most freeing truths in all the Bible and kind of turn it in uh, on ourselves. I'll, I'll speak of myself. You know, I can hear the good news uh, that my acceptance before God is not based on anything that I do, but based on faith in Jesus. And I can hear that somehow and take that into my mind, into, into my heart, and hear that as it's the strength of my faith that saves me. It's the power of my faith that saves me. Now, I may not say it like that. My theology can tell me better. I may not say it that way, but that's what could actually be going on internally. Uh, and what I need to remember is that it was not my faith that was crucified on a cross. It was my Savior. It is not the size of my faith or the strength of my faith that gives me righteousness, but the object of my faith who is Jesus. Let me uh, illustrate it this way. Uh, imagine, you know, you have a person who's uh, afraid of flying on airplanes and, you know, they eventually they get on this airplane and they're flying and they're terrified the entire time. But they, they get into the airport and they get on that plane and they're, they're shaking in their boots the entire time and the plane goes from one place to the other and lands safely. Now, how much faith did that person have uh, in the plane? Not much. How strong was that faith? Not very strong. But how worthy was that object? Very worthy. It could carry someone, weak faith or strong faith, from one place to the other. The strength of my faith did not make that plane any stronger. The weakness of my faith did not diminish that plane in any way. And so too, when Christ is our hope, our faith may be a strong faith, it may be a weak faith. In fact, we can bring our weak, whimpering faith to Jesus, who is strong and mighty to save. So maybe you're here and you're saying, ah, you know, I feel as if my grip on these things is just weak right now. My grip is weak. Well, the good news is that it never has been up to the strength of my grip, but it has always been up to the power of his grace and kindness towards us. So Jesus calls us to trust him uh, to all those who are weak and to all those who are weary. Strong faith or great faith, he is faithful. And so we come to Jesus, who is the object of our faith, and remember that is, is by grace through faith that explains our place. Now that's the second reminder, but we need this third reminder. I'll be brief here. Um, remember that we go on the same way that we got in. To put it another way, if grace got us in, then grace will carry us on. Look at verse three. Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? How do we make progress in the Christian life? You know, it is a very common idea uh, to think that maybe we start off with the gospel uh, for justification, 
Uh, but then we, we have to move on to something that's even deeper, uh, something that's, you know, even more profound um, when it comes to our actual progress in the Christian life. Uh, and, and, you know, this basically, it diminishes the gospel and it reduces the gospel uh, to evangelism. Like kind of, you need it to kind of get people into the front door. You need it to get people saved. But once you get saved, you leave it behind for something else. Uh, that's a common idea, but this is not what the Bible teaches. Uh, we are not justified by the gospel and then sanctified by something else like our obedience. Uh, to put it another way, we don't start the Christian life by faith in the gospel and then grow by getting beyond the gospel. There's no such thing as getting beyond the gospel in the Christian life, uh, but we go deeper into the gospel. So in verse three, Paul wants the, the Galatians to remember how they began the Christian life and then start doing the math and connecting the dots to how they should expect to continue the Christian life. Uh, the Galatians uh, began the Christian life by the Spirit. Uh, we saw in verse 2 that they received the Spirit through faith in the gospel, not by works of the law. Uh, and if that's how they began the Christian life, should they expect to continue it by the flesh? Now, the answer is a resounding no. Um, we don't uh, begin by the Spirit and faith and continue by the flesh. We don't get our justification by grace through faith in the gospel, only to get our sanctification by obedience to the law. This is not how the Christian life works. Uh, that's actually leaving the gospel behind. So how do we make progress in the Christian life? How is the gospel integral and central to the way Paul is thinking here? Now, I wanna give us one way uh, that we see it working actually in Galatians. Uh, in uh, chapter two, verse 20, Paul says something here that has been, and especially uh, as I receive from the Lord uh, the gospel even today, is helping and strengthening my own heart. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul, the one who saw glories, third heaven, all sorts of amazing things. The Apostle Paul could not get past the gospel. To Paul, the defining reality is the fact that the Son of God loved him and gave himself up. Paul could not ponder the cross and come to any other conclusion except that divine love had been aimed in his direction. So let me ask you this, what really frees us up to change? What motivates us? If the deepest motivation for change is a kind of fear of judgment, you know, this, this motivation, it won't last, uh, it won't be worship. Uh, how about if the deepest motivation for change is just simply a command, just do it, just to do it, you know, then it doesn't engage the heart. It, it's only skin deep. Even if the deepest motivation for change is my love and devotion for Jesus, then even that love is not deep enough. It comes and it goes. There are days where I'm just running after Jesus and there are days where I, that's not what describes my love for Jesus and my devotion. It waxes and it wanes. But if the deepest motivation for change is the immovable, unchanging love that God has for me, then this is a well that will never run dry. It is an ocean with no bottom to it. And this is what the cross of Jesus is showing us. It is God's love on display. This is what Paul is enthusing about. He loved me and gave himself for me. Does Paul love Jesus? Yeah, he loves Jesus, but Jesus loves him more. Do we love Jesus? Okay, we love Jesus, but Jesus loves us more. 
our greatest love on our best day pales in comparison to the enormous love of God. His love is the reason why we even love Him at all. So here's what we have in Jesus. We have a relationship uh, that is just gloriously lopsided. (laughs) You know, His love for us always outpaces our love for Him. In Christ, it's impossible for God to love you more than He already does right now. We can never be more loved because of our obedience, never less loved because of our failings, and this is the kind of good news that fuels every single step in the Christian life. We are in, we are loved, and this is the joy that the gospel gives. So friends, we never outgrow the gospel. Uh, We never leave it behind. And so with the empty hands of faith, uh, let's receive the promise and the power uh, of God's love in Christ for us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your dying love for us. Give us eyes to see more and more what that means. You are always outpacing us. Maybe we sense our hearts are not as warm for you as it ought to be. We thank you that you are not lacking in any zeal for us. Help us to see that and free us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.